That part. Oh man, I've seen people sweat. This is Champagne is also a band podcast. One songwriter, one song. I'm Sven, your host for a journey into the music of Champagne Urbana. Recorded in the Blue Box Studio with a songwriter from the Champagne Urbana music scene, past or present. Champagne is also a band podcast is proud to be a part of the Champagne Showers Podcast Network. Welcome to Champagne is also a band podcast. Today I have Jose Guzman and you may know Jose Guzman from such groups as Mr. Chair, the Casa Quartet, Eddie Barbush and the Casa Quartet and the Afro-Caribbean Jazz Collective. So Jose, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Excellent. So today we're going to be listening to your composition, mm-hmm. Olande Pa Uste, and it was performed by the UIUC Latin Jazz Ensemble. Yeah, it was right here on Craner, actually, on Excellent. the black box. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, so I might as well mention that we're hanging out in the lobby of the Cranert Center for Performing Arts, and Jose was kind enough to meet up with me and have a conversation about his song. So without further ado, let's listen to the song.
Welcome back. So, Jose, normally my favorite question to ask is what came first? Was it the music or was it the words? But since this is an instrumental composition, I have to ask, where did the initial idea come from? Do you usually compose on the guitar because you're a guitarist or you're a percussionist? So do you start off with a percussive? Yeah, you got uh, that. Yeah, good yeah. question. Usually, I work. It's a combination of things because um, if you from the nature of the compositions, since it's a big band chart, I need a piano to decipher in, select a group of notes that go together, right? Correctly. Uh, in this case, it was the melody first. Actually, it was the melody first that came to be, and then it lined up perfectly with the drum pattern that we call Holandes, which is Puerto Rican folklore. And as I was putting harmony to the melody, I found myself like, oh, this is actually our chord progression from a jazz standard, which is part of, the, that's the nature of the jazz language, right? So we just learn something, and sometimes we write new music to known chord progressions. Okay. Yeah, that's a tradition that we got from way years ago, yeah. So is it that bass line that starts off with the, the, no, the, the melody, horn, or is it that... So the, did it, the, the, da, 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 da. That was right. that, that was the first thing, and then okay. there's there's that little tricky like da 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 di da, like yeah. And then as I just was looking for harmonies, I just fit in like a glove on this on yeah. this jazz standard progression. The the standard is called bebop by Disa Gillespie. I'm kind of curious when you began writing this song. Do you create a chart? Do you? I mean, do, yeah, do, yeah. Is the is it broken out, and then? Since since you answered quickly, I, I'm curious, how do you think about creating kind of, I want to say, a base for the soloist kind of takeoff? Or do you, is that something that you even consider? That's something that I 100% trust on the, on the basis. I guess there, there's a couple of questions there. First, uh -huh. I, yes, I make a chart. I make what we call a lead sheet. So mm -hmm. basically, that's the melody with the harmony on top of it. That's... Basically, the structure, once the melody comes in, it follows it through and through, even when the soloists are going, right? What's happening before and after, then I'm playing a little bit with the form, right? Like right. decomposing it and putting in drum solo here and getting away from the harmony. And the harmony doesn't start till I say it again. As to like, well, writing bass line for a solo, it's like there's a tradition in jazz and, and popular music in general where the performer is already expected to have a say let's call it an encyclopedia mm -hmm. of rhythms uh, patterns of bass lines that when they're thrust into a situation they can just masterfully just take over and that was uh, by emma taylor emma taylor's on the bass uh, yeah, so yeah. she's ripping it on that yeah was the uiuc latin jazz ensemble the first group to perform your piece or did somebody else i played this in my recital 2014 Yeah, 2014, okay. back in Puerto Rico, when I graduated from the conservatory. But it was guitar, piano, bass, drums, and I say drums because it was a drum set, but we have our special drums in Puerto Rico, and we use those in there as well. Tito Carrillo, uh, for those that, that don't know in the audience about him, he is the trumpet teacher at UIUC, at University of Illinois. And he leads the ensemble, and he always has an open call to students that can compose and arrange, because we take big band lessons, and big band writing lessons, so we can put our skills into practice. So, and that's why I brought all on this to, to him, and he was very grateful and gracious of being like, yeah, let's do this, let's talk about it. When you wrote this out, what is the typical, of this style, what is the typical, I guess you could say, instrumentation? Because you're, you're certainly coming from a tradition from Puerto Rico, Go mm. of this jazz style. Mm. Is there? I'm. I'm. This yeah. is maybe more of a general question, but no, I'm curious if that's something that always is. It something that you can always expect, or is it varied? That's a great question. I'd love to say that I came up with the idea, but no, uh, mm. <laughs> of the instrumentation. There are several Puerto Rican jazz artists that have meshed the tradition of Puerto Rico's folklore music, and I say that in a very general way because besides the West African 
descendant styles of bomba en plena we have also western descendant styles which is more like spaniard and so actually artists jazz artists have worked with both styles so in instrumentation they vary in big bands that's very few probably i'm the i'm one of five Puerto Ricans that probably have written for this magnitude. Other than that, orchestra composers might be fiddling with the Western style, but traditional, 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 real backyard where you mm -hmm. want to see this kind of music, it's just drums and singer. Oh, okay. So it's just usually just a singer that's singing a, a melody or a verse, which can be either joyous or it can be work related, no different than the work songs here in mm -hmm. the cotton industry back in the 1800s. So we had you, you have that and you have a choir that answers it. So you still have the call and response okay. nature of <laughs> it. It all comes back to Africa, right? So even jazz has a very strong African descendant feel to it. And It actually you can put both styles of bomba and jazz and they mesh pretty nicely like I've, I've tried in this in this composition actually in a in a weird way I wasn't necessarily sure how I wanted to talk about your piece because you know there's there's such a, a western idea of that there's there's like a format which I mean there is but I kind of started off with kind of like a sonata format in my head mm -hmm. you know so I'm just I'm, I, I start off I'm like there's well there's the intro and then I'm like here's the exposition here's the recapitulation and mm -hmm. here's the you know mm -hmm. uh, which I, I mean well, in forms pop, forms work yeah, because pop, forms in work in pop it's no different right intro verse chorus verse chorus oh there's a bridge why <laughs> right <laughs> risk right. taker modulations and, <laughs> and so on yes I was thinking about how you started off with the drum motif and then you used your melodic motif which you have kind of the more of the lower toned creating bump 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 you know um, which I'm sure I just butchered and I apologize but there's that expansion of from just those notes to different harmonies that I want to say each of the individual instruments mm -hmm. is contributing mm -hmm. uh, a part to the overall harmony then comes there's there's some flourish with the melody kind of some exploration but mm -hmm. then you get into the solo parts how do you choose did you say okay there there's a spot for three soloists mm -hmm. those that want to perform a solo please step well, forward or is or is it kind of like you had in mind you're like alto sax trumpet and piano yeah so it, it, it always depends by the way i love how you just describe the piece just like mm. unraveling which is like in the sense of like oh there's this motif and then it kind of expands and that's that's how i try to think about it as as we go but back to your soloist question usually i have a tendency of giving several options because I never know who's going to play with me or who's at the chair, right? Right. Um, sometimes the alto can be a great lead alto, what we what we call somebody that leads a band, but sometimes soloing-wise, you might not want to do that. Or with trumpet players, you know, maybe the real good trumpet player who can nail the changes, meaning play a mm. solo, mm -hmm. is actually the guy that's leading the trumpet section, so you don't want to tire that face out. So there's right. a lot of there's a lot of things that we gotta think. So I, I usually just give them, I think the tenor has what we call chord changes, so it has the opportunity. Trombonists also have the opportunity and guitarists usually so you want to break up wind instruments and mm -hmm. instruments that use what we their face right their lips right because they tire and yeah and, and if you're if this is if this is piece number eight out of out of a three hour concert you're gonna be very you're, you're gonna be hated you know yeah well this isn't necessarily like a, a mid-tempo song it's it's got some oh, yeah, to brilliant. it so yeah, yeah, yeah. you even sang a little bit of of that line where there's that bit of flourish <laughs> to the melody <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially if you're doing things like that, and then ask someone to do a solo. I feel like you're you're, you're definitely pushing. It. So I can I can the, depending on the it. person, it might go well. Some people are already into it, but then there's the type of person that that's like, really, I have to deal with this. That's my process. I just leave it open as to as many soloists as possible within reason. Because sometimes in rehearsal, that's what rehearsals are good for we can try opening for six and then we go like well it's been an opus of 15 minutes mm. we're rivaling beethoven over here right well i think it's really interesting maybe this is just 
uh, I keep thinking of the first person that has to, who does the solo first, right? Mm -hmm. The alto sax kicks in as the first soloist. There's that kind of, I know that it's referential, but it, I kind of think of it as like mimicry of that bump, bump, bump. The saxophone player, Matthew Story, yeah. does a, a modal change to, to that line. I don't know. I, I kind of love when soloists do that, where they take what's kind of out there and then they, they play with it kind of the theme and variation yeah, kind yeah, of idea. Yeah, yeah exactly. um, And not to say that sometimes a blazing solo right out of the gate isn't wonderful as well but i kind of okay yes kind of hat tip to the theme and mm -hmm. then i'll go ahead and and now here's how i'm going to play with it but that which, also comes with the soloist because actually like what you just described is matthew's beautiful way of improvising i, I, I play mm -hmm. with him here in trampine a lot and he tends to play like that he tends to be very motivic well here mm -hmm. he'll, he'll present it and and he'll be like hey this is the idea and then he'll transform it i think jack cassidy is the next one Mm -hmm. on trumpet who's just like blazing just like get out of my way you know <laughs> that like chicago attitude which i also love so it's it's great to have two characteristic and personalities mm -hmm. in it that, yeah. are con that are very contrasting like that i'm trying to picture this performance going down i didn't i didn't see if it was on youtube or anything no, no, no. like that but what part were you playing during this performance were you conducting were you performing were you i was you, the drummer you were the drummer yeah, okay yeah so 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 there's, there's a drummer and the drummer set and the drum set i mm -hmm. was the drummer on the conga but we gotcha. have barriles so the thing about the genre uh, about it is that if you look up bomba puerto rico you can see several videos of up to 10 drums, circles, and they're all playing a pattern, but there's only one improvised. You better not get in his way. <laughs> right. Um, well, and that's the funny, because you do, like, towards the end, as part of the recapitulation, I call it, is mm -hmm. after the piano solo and the bongos and the congo. Uh, are there are bongos in there, is correct? No, 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 no. Oh, no, it's just congas. It's, it's okay. just congas with the drum set. Okay. Um, I can't um, remember if there was a timbale, but. That rhythmic motif comes back, and that's when the kind of percussion i want to say percussion solo comes in um, that's where i where try my playing best. on the you're, you're, you're on the congas so um, yeah i was playing on the congas yeah were you thinking about the solo part well i was just thinking uh, you had mentioned that in that's in the style of bamba that you'll have several percussionists but don't step on the drummers and i was thinking about how um, how straight I want to say the the drum set was going while you were doing your part, and I said, "Oh, that's that's that part." That was what I was thinking about. Yeah. But as a composer, as the arranger, as the person that brings it to an ensemble to perform, and as a performer yourself during your own piece, how do you not get lost in the solos? And how do you get a chance to actually enjoy how someone is taking something that you've done in terms of the soloist improvising? Or, or is that just old hat to you? But, I mean, no, it's a that's good kind of exciting. It's a good question cause, um, because I can see how, like, oh, I didn't like how this solo did this. or what. Man, I don't tend to think like that at this point because I've done it for so long. It's, it's it's a live and breathe in the moment kind of thing. Or I guess the other thing is, if I don't like the solo, it's change it. Mm. I've had it happen to me where it's like, hey, you're great, you're doing great on this tune, but I don't think we need guitar. I don't think guitar is mm. called for. You know, we'll do another thing, which is nothing wrong, I think. So you're asking me if I get distracted, if I like, exactly. I don't mean it wrong. necessarily. And do you ever have that fear of like getting? getting lost and like wow that's like what they're doing is magical and in some ways i've created a form something for them to play against it's very is, surreal it's very surreal like yeah. i can tell you it's very surreal that you you spend nights staring at a computer and at the keyboard and you're just banging away hoping something works and then when you sit there you're in a room with 16 other musicians and they're just playing you just go like i did all this Mm -hmm. So it's very, very interesting and surreal in that in that sense. I get more lost in the excitement of like, wow, I'm I'm bringing clay to the classroom. Everybody, mm. everybody's enjoying their time with it. You, know? you mentioned earlier, and I guess as part of what I consider maybe my favorite part of the song, the solos are great. There's something about, and you mentioned this before, you alluded to this before, that there is in the tradition to have a call and response, mm. and I feel as as part of the outro 
outro as your and and I I'm just calling it the outro because it's it's like right after that percussion solo and the return of the horns and then mm-hmm. the the horn and the sax is, are are kind of uh, call and response back and forth the, the melody in different kinds of ways and and I'm curious was it written out that way or was it set up to be no. um, a little sure. improvised good question in some ways, yeah. Yeah. It's, so it's it's a combination it kind of calls back into some salsa bomba and plena songs from that I grew up listening mm. where at the end of the tune they kind of like or as they're wrapping up the tune they're wrapping up a tune that's supposed to be a party tune so all of a sudden the mood changes to like they're having a party in the studio right right so in a certain way it's like we're in the city we're in in big band land but then when we go out to the drums we're, we're out in the woods we're mm. we're out having fun in the sugar cane fields right huh. that's where the genre developed in the sugar cane Cane fields, so it's like we're out in true cane fields. We're having fun because unlike here in the states, where they the slaves got their drums taken away in Puerto Rico, like they actually were kind of encouraged. Hmm. That's a whole other topic. I'm not saying any, anybody was a nicer master slave right. or whatever. Yeah, but um, I'm just saying historical facts, and and it's that's the part where it's supposed to be like we're out, we're by the bonfire with the drums, and we're just dancing, and and the trumpet and the alto, and I think a couple more people are just giving the liberty of like go at it. Oh yeah, you know, just make noise, just wear a party, laugh, cry, whatever. Mm. You know, so it's supposed to have that. That sort of a vibe. That's what I'm calling the vibe. This may be a real question, or this may be just a... I, I don't know if this is even a thing. No. But the abrupt ending, is that a traditional choice, or is that just how you... As it's I said, it's kind it of a weird... It's kind of how it happened. Um, okay. Because that's a hard thing. The hard thing, once you start writing music, it's like, okay, so how do I end? Where does this go first? Right. And then it's like, okay, so how do I end this? Right? Because yeah. then it's like, okay, so we got all this big thing happening how do we turn it down back to thank you for everything <laughs> right so yeah that's how it turned out bum, 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 bum. yeah that's how it ended, yeah hmm. i have a hard time thinking about how to end a song is like is it is it one of those like it's a held out chord it's a held out single note it's a you know quick abbreviated end mm-hmm. and so i'm kind of curious is it is that something that happened in rehearsal or is that something that you wrote out or you, you know what i'm saying yeah yeah I no guess. i wrote it out i wrote okay. I, I wrote out yeah the, those those i'm pretty sure so what's happening as the party's going on with uh-huh. like three or four instruments and the rhythm section are back into keeping time there's other horns and other counter melodies happening at the same time and i was just like okay this just needs a a bang this just yeah. needs a big bang to, to end it does it can't be uh I, right. I, I kind yeah. of felt that our, our character, it's very our character, just because everything was so pop, pop, pop. Right. And actually, I think the only long chord that's held is before the, the alto solo. Other right. than that, it, so I guess it's serving to what the music is already telling you, right? <laughs> Yeah. Sometimes well, the most obvious one is the one that you go like, no, I don't want to do it. But sometimes that's the best one. <laughs> yeah, it, it's interesting that you brought up that that chord. I wasn't I wasn't going to ask about this, but there, there's a certain like mood from that one chord being held out just before the solo comes in, and I and I keep thinking it's like the. I don't know why it does this, and and I'll probably will take this out, but it gives me this whole film noir PI, mm. like a yeah. private investigator just about to close the case, mm. kind of sound, and then boom, and then back in. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's into yeah, the solo. Well, but I mean, that's well, I, thank it, you. That's that's a good. I mean, I'll, I'll take film noir as a compliment. <laughs> uh, no, it's great because like um, that is it's supposed to be like the merger of these two different things. It's just yeah. opposing this two different traditions where it's actually when you take a step back it's like oh wait they're they have more in common than i thought probably so i guess speaking on on those two different traditions like how did you discover those two traditions and then how did you bring those together in Uh, your in your own work is it something that is already existent where it, mm. it 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 already there's a blended 
blended sense of those two co- yeah or, like I mentioned or, okay. yeah, yeah yeah there's there's I'm like the fi- I mean that I know of and I'm pretty sure I'll get I'll get um, a lot of flack for this but that I know of I'm probably a one of five probably ten and I'm and I'm on the very bottom part of that totem mm. of Puerto Rican artists who have Merch the style. So Bomba is a West African descendant style that is folklore in Puerto Rico. I mean, if you say bluegrass, then you can go like, okay, yeah, I think I've heard a bluegrass tune or two. Not saying that blue. I mean, it's the same complexity. Within bluegrass, there's probably a lot of others subgenres and style so bomba in puerto rico is similar and all on this is one of the genres so in, back in the conservatory i had very small experience of playing charts written by one of these other jazz artists that would blend it and in a way i just thought you know and it, it, that's always been my purpose as of late is finding or sharing my identity within my music and I thought that jazz is a great vehicle for me since it's given me so much and I've learned so much from it. It's like, oh, I think musical identity of mixing Puerto Rican folklore with this jazz, it's perfect. And then that's the basis of the Afro-Caribbean Jazz Collective. It's I'm writing today's show is all mostly all original tunes, 12 tunes. Mm. And it's m- mostly that identity, my identity within this context of it. What is your favorite part of this piece? I would have to say the soli. Mm. Oh man, I've seen people sweat. <laughs> people, it's that thing is sixteen measures long only. For the audience, for you audience members, that's about eighteen eight seconds or nine mm-hmm. seconds of music. But there are so many notes that I wrote in there that it can be. It can be intimidating. A lot of people. It's when I handed in this chart, that was the phrase that I kept hearing through all the rehearsal rooms mm. of, of everybody individually, just like, "Oh God, dig it up, dig it up, dig it." <laughs> yes. You know. So, but I would say that's one of them. Not not because of that. It's a great solely that it's one of the few things that I. <laughs> I'm very proud of writing. It's like, man, if I could write more like that, right. if I could do more like that. It's not like just a straight melisma of notes. It's it's actually broken up into these these kind of triplets, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. They're they're uneven surfaces. Wherever you you'd expect a spike in the melody to be a downbeat, it's like no, that's actually <laughs> you know the the third sixteenth note or something like that, or the fourth. Or you go like. Yeah. Jag- it's jaggedy for sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. My final question really is why did you pick this song to be the song that you wanted to talk to me about on the show? First, I guess it's one of the, my biggest technical achievements as a composer. And I, I just find that that piece has so many... It foreshadowed a lot of the things that I'm doing now with my own ensemble. And I just hope that somebody out there is listening and they go like, they, they're having the same thought as I have, of like, what's my identity within my music? And hopefully that shines a light, right? So sometimes we don't have to look too hard. Just look to where you already, you already know. And that, it's already there, yeah. Champagne is also a band podcast is proud to support Jubilee Cafe. Jubilee Cafe is a free weekly meal program at Community United Church of Christ, 805 South 6th Street in Champaign, Illinois. Jubilee Cafe serves a home-cooked meal from 5 to 6.30 each Monday. Their mission is to feed hungry people by cooking healthy, delicious meals and by serving their guests restaurant-style with servers waiting on tables. Jubilee Cafe is open to anyone who cares to eat with them. Because food insecurity among students is so high, they serve students as well as others in and around the Champaign-Urbana community who struggle with hunger. Meals are free to all and will be served each Monday evening, located in the accessible lower level of the building at 6th and Daniel Streets in Champaign. For more information on the meal or how to volunteer, Go to the Jubilee Cafe CUCC Facebook page or email them at jubilee.cafe at community-ucc.org. That's jubilee.cafe at community-ucc.org.
Welcome back. So, Jose, do you have a favorite Champagne Urbana venue, past or present? Well, let's see. I miss the Iron Post. Mm. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, sadly, uh, for audience members, that used to be the jazz venue here. And sadly, during the pandemic, uh, we lost Paul, Paul, who was in charge of it. A cool music venue. What was the... There was, a couple years ago, a Champagne cover-up. You know that? Um, the great cover-up? The great cover-up. Uh. And, and there was a venue, It's which it looks... It, it's on First Street. I remember that. And it's by the... Oh by the fresh market if i'm not mistaken big bar area big band. probably you can sit you can fit in a thousand people and that was a great that was a great concert was that was that the fat city probably i don't know it's a concert venue on first street first street yeah i remember doing that that was a fun show wine city center when, when oh, the city center. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. It used to be Fat City, and now it's now it's called the city center. Okay, yeah. Okay. So we were, we, <laughs> we were in the right place. Okay. Yes. So, oh, boom, yeah. Picking so. Up. so I think one of my favorite concerts in the Champagne area concert venues has been Fat City. That was a that was an interesting venue. But the that was city center. The city was center it? now oh, yeah. nowadays. Yeah. Um, but um, I played on a great cover up. We did. Um, Blowfish. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we did out the aha cover. Um, oh, real big fish. Real big fish. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So in that venue, we play real big fish. Uh, we play as real big fish. I can't remember. There was somebody else kicking butt doing smashing pumpkins, but we did real oh. big fish, and that was was real that fun. the decadence. Oh, or yeah. Decadence, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that was a cool venue. I like that venue a lot. Um, I've been to the to the Craner Hall um, venues, and I've had the perfor- the chance of being both audience and performer. For some of them, it's great for classical. For some, some of them for jazz, it's not doesn't work out. I'm just gonna leave it there. <laughs> yeah, I have to say, most. I mean, actually, the lobby stage is mm-hmm. probably the best one because I think all of the normal halls and mm. stages here are so well acoustically balanced that the sound kind of dies and there's not that splash mm. of of brightness that comes with a lot of jazz sounds mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. i think that the, they're not meant for drum sets <laughs> right right yeah <laughs> once you put a drum set in there it just dies off yeah I'm curious, uh, what do you think makes a good music community? One that is willing to listen and collab- collaborate, I guess, is one of the best ones. Um, just because you get a chance to play each other's music. It's not so much only me, 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 look at what I can do, where it's more more of like, hey, I saw you play at this venue, you want to come and play in, in this show, and... I can't remember. I got I got pulled on the side once for something like that. Like, hey, you're. I saw you play a jazz gig. You want to play this rock show in a DIY house party? And I was like, sure. <laughs> and that was fun. And because I played with people there that I probably probably wouldn't have played with before, just because circumstances of of academia and, and schooling, as opposed to like how many how often do I go to DIY parties? I think one that's willing to collaborate, listen and listen. It's very easy, especially now now that knowledge is so reachable, to be involved in the toxicity of eliteness of like, oh but this is better. Oh but this as if we're not talking sports kids. You know, we're right we have each our elements where we're all good at and we are just looking to express ourselves you know there's no basket there's no goal there's no um you know there's no pointage system that you can say oh this is the best band this is the best so and so right. um right. so i guess one that listens and collaborates really yeah Champagne is also a band podcast is proud to support Exile on Main Street. Exile on Main Street, located in the old train station building at 100 North Chestnut Street in downtown Champaign, has been helping to build record collections since 2004. Carrying a wide array of new and used LPs, CDs, and video games. Exile on Main Street has something for just about any music enthusiast and old school gaming devotee. 
Exile also hosts regular free live music shows on its stage, so be sure to check out their Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter pages for the up-to-date details on the next upcoming event. Open seven days a week. They can be reached by phone at 217-398-MAIN. That's 217-398-6246. Welcome back. Jose, what is your favorite non-musical thing or things? Running. Running. Yeah, yeah, because, like, um, funny enough, like, I ran each... So I lived here four years. Mm -hmm. Each year I ran the full or the half marathon and i i really this is quite a i love the this area to run just because it's so flat and nice mm-hmm. um there's some little bit of hills but nothing to tweak your ankle um, right what else um, camping is something that i enjoy a lot yeah. lately yeah i've been something that i've been enjoying now that i am i'm a freelancer and and out of school and no deadlines mm-hmm. i me and my partner, we usually just go like, so what do you got on Tuesday? Nothing. What do you got on Wednesday? Nothing. We want to go camping? Sure. Excellent. <laughs> and we just get away into wilderness, get away from the noise of the city, right? Right, right. Yeah. So the first thing that you mentioned was running. Mm. And I just happened to notice on the socials that perhaps you're going to be running the Chicago Marathon oh, yeah. in 2023. Yeah. But you're also running for a charity yes yes mercy home heroes charity yeah excellent so to the show notes i'd like to add oh. add your link so i'll yeah, I'll, sure. I'll be in contact yeah, with it's, that. A, it's a great organization located in west town in chicago they help out families and kids who are in neglect who have problems with stability they help them through their several programs they don't take families apart they mm. try they have space and housing for kids if they need to and families if they need to and and help them get on their feet they got the appropriate tools to address all 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 their needs and most of the kids have turned out to be you know great humans and it's Mm. this will be the second time that i run it and and honestly it's it's a great organization that i i'm glad to support there's something about putting the effort into training for a marathon when you know that it's more than just you going out and having a race you're actually running for a reason yeah exactly. so like the, the the point at which your head says oh, why did i even sign up for this at mile 23 and you only have 3.2 left and it's just that one thing where you're like well i'm not it's not just me that i'm doing this for and i can push myself yeah. a little extra so i going back to your second thing mm-hmm. we're talking tent camping do you no, you, no, no glamping here. No glamping. Okay, I'm just curious. <laughs> no, no, you know, because, no, no. you know, uh, all, all that's good. Get out in nature. Get out in the air. No, you yeah. Know. Um, tent. Tent. We have, a, like, a, I think it's supposed to be a, a four-person tent where you can stand up. So it's pretty tall. Mm. I, do, I have fire starters. Like, I'm ready to go to just... Yeah, I'll, I'll share with you some pictures. Like we, we the other day, we took the uh, iron pan scale with us, uh-huh. <laughs> and we yeah. were making sausages and pancakes, and it was twenty degrees outside. Oh yeah, and there was like snow everywhere because we went camping in the snow. We looked, we just like it that much. Do you have a favorite place to go? It's kind of your default camping. If you just can't make up your mind, you're just like we're going here. Lately, it's Chain of Lakes. Chain of Lakes, um, and that's like an hour, an hour, so- an hour northwest from Chicago. There's another one, the Illinois State Park Beach in Scion. Mm. That one's nice too. But if I really want to go for stars, Wisconsin. Mm. I've seen that Wisconsin by Door County, so way up, uh, oh, up, yeah. up, up, way up in the palm of, of Wisconsin. There's like a a nice door county area camping place that's great for for star watching so the order of it is of business that once we get to the campground is that as i'm tending to the fire partner janice she's taking care of the tent and by the time we get both going it's like okay are you done are you done oh oh relaxing okay cool yeah yeah so we we, we've got it down we got it nailed down to a (laughs) t that's great that's great well jose thank you so much for being on the show and meeting up with me at craner center for the performing arts in 
just before your show and yeah, um it's been it's been a pleasure to be able to talk with you you know this this just all reminds me about just the richness of what the champagne urbana music scene really adds to the whole of all the music genres like there's mm. so much out there and so much to listen to and hear so i really appreciate you coming thank you. on thank you show. yeah no um one of the main reasons why i wanted to be here is to share with you my experience but i also just want to say that champagne urbana is the place to be at to get any experience that you want to do i mean i play i play with an orchestra in full in your hall how mm -hmm. many times can you say i cannot guitar players say i mean i was playing banjo i was playing poor game best's solo on banjo but you know i did that i did some brian stark is doing flamenco jazz things so there's flamenco jazz going around my partner she used to play in the tango orchestra i don't know if you know that there's even a tango festival here in town huh i play with them i play with Rob rock bands as I mentioned, cover bands, uh, I did jazz as my study. Champagne has it all. Yeah. There's like they don't you don't have to envy anybody. Thank you for listening to Champagne is also a band podcast. This is Jose Guzman reminding you, great music is out there. Go find it where you live. a wrap. You almost have an NPR voice. It's so good. Studio South Peter on the inside. So what you got on Tuesday? Nothing. What do you got on Wednesday? Nothing. We're gonna go camping.